those are constraints. We understand those, but it should not be, we should not be driven by our constraints because that's the old way of approaching our, our sort of economic systems. Looking at the constraints that we impose because we have, we want to have our piece of this sort of, we want to be a part of this, this sort of life cycle. What I'm, what I'm saying is that I think that um, I'm not saying that I have the answer to it, but what the thing that brought me, um, that made me think was that it's about community. Volume and liquidity are about community. And I think it's about influencing our future to enable the next generation to see the world differently and give them the skills that they need to have in order to thrive in this new digital economy. Now. Um, that's a very broad statement. I get it. And it's very early. I haven't had a coffee. I heard my coffee mug thing <laughs> beep. So I'm going to need that in a second here. Go but I think it. it's really about, <laughs> I think it's really about unlocking education. I think this entire, where we're going down, I think now we'll be like, we will be the, we'll be the next sort of OGs of this next evolution because mm -hmm. you will see that it's, it's not about working within constraints. It's about changing the mindset of the community and what, rohan when i joined you talked about this glue factor there's a glue factor that you talked about community stella myself lutra and yourself whatever there are certain aspects that bring certain people that draw people in from a certain um a higher as a res as a french raison d'être like mm. a higher level of operational excellence that's what i think i, I i'm can be very wrong. That's just my 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 sort of feeling that I have. But the only thing that works in smaller groups are not really. So it's a, yeah, it's a it's an interesting point. How do you how does change take place? It only starts with one person. There's a video we used to watch back in leadership uh, training courses, and it's it's kind of silly, but it's this one guy at a rave. Okay, my my European my German friends know about raves. Okay, yeah, and so this was Especially an open yeah ones. yeah this was <laughs> a open, oh my god I, I remember like these crazy songs but there was this one guy out in a festival in the middle of some hill and he's doing a there's a music playing and he's doing a dance Rohan he's doing this dance he's just like moving like this he's like this one guy one guy and when you look at this video you're like oh my god this guy is crazy okay but then what happens somebody comes because he's by himself with in a field of people he's the only one dancing like this crazy dance and he's no shirt he's like he's like this and somebody comes up and they start dancing and he's like no 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 this is not how you dance this is how you, and he moves their arms you got and then they're like okay that one person turned into the entire festival by the end of the video mm. I'll, i i would love to sh like sh i don't know if you can show the video like that if you uh, i can find it but it was it such is... a impactful video on me that i was like this is this is what change is about and so that's what i would say it's change starts with a spark and once that spark catches the the draw the the other feeds of grass mm. it ignites a fire of change that you can never i, I actually turn back. once made up a name for this i call this the impact chain <laughs> impact chain uh, yeah because yeah. Yeah. because it's you know it starts with like much less right the, the the guy crazy you know dancing at a festival seems like something very exceptional Right, that maybe I found it. you know yes. introverts or ambiverts would not feel like they could ever do this, uh, but then you know Absolutely. something like for example, um, you're you know you're running after like you know or not after but you're running towards like your subway right or your metro, and you get on but then you see someone who's like let's say you know five ten meters out right and you hold the door for them it changes everything it changes everything about that yeah. person it changes everything about how their day goes how your day goes right and yeah. it's something we yeah, cannot really sure. measure because how would we be able to measure that right yeah uh, so unless we could connect those systems into one system of emotions essentially 
which are apparently not measurable, right? Then, you know, how do yeah, you I measure disagree. that? I disagree. I think emotions are measurable. I think emotions are very they much measurable. They probably are, but I we think... haven't built a system for it yet. And also we but cannot I, but take I, it no, out of but people's I... brains, let's just say. Sorry, I, I think Facebook built their entire um, commerce program off of emotions. <laughs> they oh, did, true, by yeah. connecting with people. Like, you remember yeah. Coke? Remember back in the day where when Facebook first started, oh, you can poke a friend. And I'm like, what the hell is this? You can like them. And so, um, I don't know who joined here, but uh, what, I was, what I was going to... What's that? Seeker joined. Oh, oh Seeker. <laughs> hi. Um, the... Yeah, hi, guys. Just dropping in to say hi. I have, to have I have only nine more minutes. I have some, something other to catch on to, so I thought I'll just drop in. No I haven't been here. I haven't been around for some time. <laughs> no problem. I was just going to say, Stella. I, uh, the the I think mood is one of those things that is a very uh, emotions are one of the most powerful things that you can capture. But like to roll like what Rohan said earlier about from an artificial intelligence that that. That's a little bit more challenging, right? When you have a a um, a like there are mechanisms to do it. I, I I'm a I'm a I'm a I, I'm a believer. But to your point about the people that hold the door open, when we used to go up in our towers, right, 15, 17, 18 um, uh, story towers. Ask me a question. What were those days that I remembered when I first started my day? Still, if you ask me, what were those days I remember? Yeah. I remember the day where I'd be going to the elevator and somebody would close the elevator because they were in a hurry to get up. <laughs> I remember those yeah. days. And the other days I remember when some when the elevator would be packed and somebody and I saw the door closing, I see these people and I'm running late, and all of a sudden I see this godly hand <laughs> on the elevator. And it was like And yeah. I'm like, who's this person? And they're like, come. Come yeah. and I'm looking like, yeah. no, but you're full. Peter's full. No, yeah. we'll make room for one more. I felt like I was on a spaceship to heaven. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. like, it was no better feeling in the world. No, yeah. that's what, that's that what change, I would say. It changes everything. I know. Yeah. It changes everything. I agree. So yeah. I, I believe, I believe, you know, there are two people. We believe, some people believe humanity is just destitute for evil and it's just, it, it's, it, it, it it's full of evil and i think there's some people believe that the world is full of uh, goodness i believe that the world is full of both but i believe that there's more good than there is evil and i think, I think that we yeah. just have to inspire the the goodness in other people to strive yeah. to want to be better that's it we could transform that into the world is full of potential sorry was someone saying something no uh, you I, go. You know, I was saying uh, one of my favorite courses in college, so I went into engineering college, so most of my work, was, I mean, most of the stuff was very engineering heavy, but we had three humanities courses, and my favorite one was modern political concepts. I was taught by this amazing professor who's had like a, like a bunch of experiences across the world, and, uh, and a, 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 like a very fundamental part that really changed me was the state of nature arguments brought by Rousseau, um, Hobbes, and Locke. So these were three like yeah, philosophers uh, or like political thinkers who uh, that their core belief like they actually deferred in their core beliefs as to what humans are. And their arguments was that if you imagine a state of nature where like humans are isolated, where uh, let's imagine that's how the society yeah. formed. Like isolated humans start banding together, which is not how it happened. But if we imagine that's how it started, Hobbes believed that the state of nature was a state of war. Like everybody would just be in constant war with each other, take resources from each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wolf um, to a wolf, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, then Locke, Locke has an argument where it's like, okay, it is a state of war, but it's not really that bad. I think, like, it's like, uh, in the sense that uh, he was trying to argue that um, it's not worse than tyranny is in under, let's say, someone like Hitler or something. I mean, not, that wasn't the argument, but the argument is that. Uh, we should strive to make, make better societies because the state of nature is not as bad, but it's pretty bad and we should make better societies. And Rousseau had this belief that the human nature by definition was just beautiful and people loved each other, but society is what ruined us. Like jealousy yeah. is what's coming in when you start having land ownership and things like that. 
in we... ways destroying it yeah so it, uh, to me like it was very fascinating going through those ideologies because that fundamental belief as to what you believe humans are uh completely changes the way you look at the world completely changes the way you look at uh society the way you think about um what you should and shouldn't do in different places i don't know uh, i don't know where i'm going with this but i i found this very fascinating cuz yeah no, i love the thought luther i'm sure I think it's it's I mean we have to how... be aware of the dark side right mm. especially if we want to construct good tokenomic systems we have to be aware uh it's not only about those guys that are, uh, have the helping hand right yeah I mean it's uh, my belief currently has is this, that most people are like I would say 90% of the people are kind of selfish but mostly nice they don't want to like ruin the system but there's there's always that 0.1% because even if you look at crime statistics it's like 99% of the crime is done by 0.1% of the people especially the violent ones and they're repeated offenders like most of the people who like do cr- crimes are like maybe one shot they maybe stole a bread like it's tiny offenses they did it once never do it again but there's some people who just keep on doing it. and the, the entire brain is like hey This is a system. How can I get, take advantage of it? And I think the goal is to look at, expect that point one percent to be there in every system we create, and try to create like some kind of safety mechanism around them. I don't, I don't know if that would ever work, but yeah. I think what you just shared, Rohan, is a very deep and very profound reflection you have, and mm. I think it. I wrote down I because you reminded me of Hobbesian way of thinking mm. and uh I think it was I think it makes total sense and I think it's something that we need to think about more because where we are is we are a consequence of the the incentives that have been established right and if I was just to draw a personal experience even y- yesterday I have this friend of mine who is highly He's oh he's 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 a very binary guy. He's a doctor, but he's a but he's a he's a uh, a psychiatrist, and so he's a, he looks at things very blindly. He's like, you know what? Um, he's like, your job is just to make money and earn a living and save as much as you can and and hoard hoard hoard. And I'm like, uh, buddy, I don't want to say his name because if anyone watches this, they're like, oh shit, right? But <laughs> <laughs> but and he's like, my practice is ruined. And I'm like, no, it's not. You're still Dr. Freud. I don't know but uh but you know what he he has this view on things and he, and even when we take our kids out together our kids are best friends and we take our kids out together and I always try and I and I I spend money and stuff and he's like why are you spending money on your kids like that you're spoiling them I'm like no I'm not it's a memorable experience for them and I said and then so he's been he's like so tight 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 and We've been going out recently and and um this is a we went to a a, a store it's a hobby store right for putting together certain hobbies that we have like um whatever mm. and um I uh, we bought something and he kicked himself because he didn't buy it because he was so he had this internal battle within him about should I get it should I not should I spend this money should I not oh do I really need it da, da, da. <laughs> and I actually bought it and I actually turned around and as I dropped him off I said hey by the way you know what you really wanted this and I know you needed it so why don't you take mine and I gave him mine and he's like no 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 you don't have to and and he was like taken back I think that that sort of um that sort of um gesture is what changes ideologies is what changes thinking and i've been on a systematic message to change this guy's thinking okay and i don't do it consciously sometimes it's unconscious but i do believe that the the um who are the what did you call them political scientists yeah uh, right. yeah um i think that there's beauty there and i i would like to really hear from the expert in this field who's amongst us lutra <laughs> lutra you are the ex you are my expert in social sciences from an uh, economics perspective right like what are your thoughts how do we how okay. do we the community there well i mean it's a uh, uh, even more phil- philosophical than economical uh, question but my answer in short would be 
uh, although um, no economist is believing, but there is some kind of free lunch. You know, we all have learned this kind of Tanstafel principle. There oh, ain't no lunch. such thing yeah. as a free yeah. lunch. And being uh, in our society, especially if you get educated as an economist, yeah, you learn that rule. Yeah, there's opportunity cost uh, everywhere, but in real life. Sometimes you make exactly those experiences. Yeah, there is a guy that is getting the beer for you, and he doesn't want anything. Yeah, I mean, I had a, a really nice experience last summer on a Scar Rock Festival. Yeah, some guy came to me, gave me a beer, uh, and I didn't know that guy, uh, and yeah. I was asking, oh, oh, "Thank you, but why?" Because you are laughing all the time. It's such a fun just watching you dancing and drinking. I want it going on. <laughs> so there is some kind of free lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I yeah. guess uh, what you know connects the spirit in our crypto space is um, we love, you know, providing public goods. Mm. We do not want the whole return. Yeah, if we can support each and every other, we are, um, well, we like it, yeah, uh, to have a smaller profit or even no profit, because there are some other things that might not be measurable in economic terms like value, price, mm. and so on. Mm. Uh, you know, go, going back to my to my initial statement that kind of like <laughs> led to this whole discussion, right? You're I'm the thinking, ignition. You're the spark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm I'm wondering. And it's heating up. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually wondering what other metrics could we introduce to a system, right? Mm. To, I mean. That, to that measure are not the necessarily, things, right? yeah. yeah, that are not necessarily yeah. quantitative by nature, but we can turn them into quantitative metrics I mean, by applying something to it. Like, you know, like if you run, for example, if you ask ChatGPT, I know it's a very dumb example, but just saying, right? If you ask ChatGPT um, uh, about like, uh, you know, a certain thing that can be measured in statistics, right? It will not primarily give you numbers. It will only give you numbers if you specifically ask for the statistics and the resources it's drawing it from, right? So I find this, I find this behavior from a machine quite interesting in the sense of, of course, that's programmed, I would assume, right? But if you're asking for statistics, why does it not give you statistics in the first place, right? Why does it give you uh, like a well-written summary, let's say, of one specific thing or situation mm. that you asked for? It could just list you. So um, this is, you know, this is uh, this has happened. This is the first thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening. The third thing that's happening, and that relates to this number, to this number, and to this number. But instead, it forms like this really nice text around it, right? right? And yeah. Yeah. barely mentions even numbers. That is because I think most people, most people in the world find numbers too abstract, right? To actually encompass how a situation was, how the present sta state of the situation is, and how it maybe from there on might evolve to the future state of, you know, whatever we're mm -hmm. talking about. Sorry, I'm making this so abstract. But... Um, I mean Human beings have a problem, you know, to think exponentially. And that's, uh, that's proven with some kind of experiments, yeah? We, we really have problems to think in this exponentially terms. And, or uh, to think about big numbers. I mean, you know, I have um, a picture um, of $100,000, let's say. But $1 trillion? What's that? Uh, it's just too big and mm -hmm. i guess that's a, that's a problem for our mind yeah yeah but i've noticed that remember... even with covid numbers by the way like if you look at um like uh, if someone if someone shows me a picture of someone who was who died because of covid or an earthquake or something one or two pictures it really affects me 
where they tell me 2500 people died and I, for some reason that's like it's it becomes less uh, it it affects me emotionally less of for some reason because it's just a random number it's it's too many people for me to visualize like when i see one image of a distraught child that's enough for me to be oh my god that's crazy like which is so strange yeah the um yeah but yeah. like, uh, i wanted to point out something as to what you were saying um i feel like the places where we could look for converting the qualitative things into quantitative things would be something like uh, what psychiatrists try to do or like some of the social scientists who have, the way they try to convert those qualitative things is through um like you know those five terms <laughs> like of um um and like check well-being to... protocol hmm so well-being protocol so there's this another person in the t community hmm. they have uh, they've been working on like two three ideas so one of them is a well-being protocol where they try to measure uh, uh the wellness of an individual yes. like from different perspectives like health and other things emotions and blah blah so that mm. they have their own approach maybe that gives you some ideas hmm like to con- you're saying like uh, they have some way to uh, they are trying to figure out a way to quantify it Are you guys watching my stream by the way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I have to go. Okay. Uh I, it's an amazing discussion up till now, so yeah. great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Thank you. See you around. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. So yeah. I I remember this this experiment from this guy, right? Because yeah. what he did is he measured 1 billion, right? And 1 100,000, 1 million, 1 billion. And then that? he I can't believe up, he counted that. Yeah, and then sorry, he added sorry. up the rise to actually measure like the total net worth of Jeff Bezos, mm-hmm. right, which is like yeah, 22 yeah, yeah. billion, yeah. I believe. Um and the visual representation of this, right? It was a total different thing. Like, you know, his yeah. net worth has been known for years. Like decades, yeah. right? It's no secret. People know this from all the like top 100 venture la 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 lists right but seeing yeah. it like this right yeah. made people realize hey if this guy yeah. were to give off even yeah. half of this right yeah. so many problems in the world could be fixed right i mean it's not that he has to just saying you know that it made people completely differently think about this right before it mm. wasn't a topic and then it was a huge topic because people through the visual representation realized how much 122 billion are really like you know mm. and i thought it was quite a nice comparison in our context i guess like But for yeah, the exponential yeah. thing right That yeah exactly yeah. right exactly yeah. yeah even like a uh, scale of the universe if someone tells you oh there are like A hundred billion, yeah, four hundred billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy and hundred billion galaxies. It's like these numbers are just so beyond That's us. Crazy. That it's like it's just very hard to imagine. But then, if someone gives you some kind of visual perspective as to oh, this is if this is the distance between Sun and Earth, which is also a lot, uh, and then this is like in comparison the distance between um, like all of those num like I think that visual comparison starts making you like oh wow or like a zoom out video of like. you go from like uh, your like a person all the way to the earth to uh, sun like if if you're zooming out into the galaxy that's also like oh my god like oh it's my god nothing. it's all empty <laughs> yeah but somehow you will get lost yeah yeah but wasn't it funny like this is a question to more of like the older people amongst us but wasn't it funny when about a year ago or not even they made this like um uh overexposed repeated image of like the deep uh the deep mm. field right that's something that was already done 1995 right yeah. but for young people like your age rohan right seeing this now it seemed like a completely new understanding on how vast the universe is right it was so funny for me because i remember i had the same kind of like uh feeling enlightened mode right in 
I got totally mm. obsessed with the um, Star Observation Center at the university. I went there like every Wednesday. I was like, oh, this is so dope. Like, what the hell, yeah. you know? Like, if that is a thing, what else could be a thing? And yeah. I just wanted to show you guys, uh, I don't know if you caught wind of that because it wasn't a huge event, but last year around the same time as now, they discovered this this little star, which is called Arendelle. And uh, Rohan, can probably make the connection to my project now <laughs> because mm -hmm. Alana owns a, sh a starship that's called Arendelle Chateau. Um, but I felt so inspired by this, you know, this is like this little, little blurry dots, right? And it's the farthest star that we have seen so far. It's the one that's farthest out, right? And that Hubble, Hubble took, I think, uh, a picture of, I hope. I hope it's mm. Hubble. I hope I'm not saying something wrong. But possibly, yeah, makes sense. But it's not only that it's in the deep field. You could, you know, you could be like, oh, this one is also really tiny. Why isn't it that one, right? No, it's just, it's this one, right? It's this specific mm. one. So, yeah, anyhow, I just thought, like, it cannot only be measured by, you know, getting like a visual representation, but also a representation of distance or flight time. So, yeah. uh, you know, if you think like how much, how much travel time, you know, the, the Hubble telescope has already, you know, completed. It's insane. Like the yeah. Hubble telescope, you know, was sent like, when was it sent out actually? Does anyone know by, by? But I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> Too long ago. I think it was in the, yeah, okay. It was 1990. 1990. Imagine that. It was like six years after I was born. This is yeah. how long this has been going. Right, this is crazy. So six years before I was born. <laughs> yeah, but this is also, you know, so the visual representation of this Arendelle uh, star, right? It can actually be translated also into travel time. So, like you guys said, I believe there is a number that we can measure emotions with, right? But how do we then factor them into a system, right? Because a system built on on logic and mathematics it has like a limitation of accepting other metrics. And I just wonder, <laughs> sorry for, for going down this rabbit hole with you. you normally I do this by myself, right? But mm. uh, how can we possibly get to factor those things on? Because right now for an AMM, it's my, in my opinion, it's not very important, right? But once we move yeah. on to the DAO chapter and incentive structures, this becomes such a huge topic because let's face it, right? most governance structures which DAOs are usually you know centered around they're not being adopted right only 10 percent of people in a DAO ever adopt them it's the same with um, tracking mechanisms of task completion right we talked about this like in my team not even 10 percent is filling those out on a regular basis if i'm lucky it's two percent right so how can we um, deploy other technologies from Web3, for example, AI, right? Or stuff we haven't thought about yet into actually building those things. And something, sorry, sorry for this, right? But something I, I saw yesterday at the East Denver um, at Twitch stream that, you know, I'm trying to attend as much as I can is they introduced um, a new blockchain, Celestra. I don't know if you guys know Celestra, but it oh, is Celestia. Um, oh, I know that's right. I've known that. Like Celestia is the uh, is the multi chain. Um, uh, I know Cel Celestia. Almost. It's not multi chain. It's a modular blockchain. It's different from a. It's a modular. Is it like Cosmos. Right? Is it like Cosmos or Polkadot? No, it's, it anchors no, well with them, but it's not the same thing. Strata, yeah. Is, is Celestial like making an emerge? Because it's been like they've been trying to pump Celestial for a while. And when it was below even a cent, it was, is it still like, uh, is, is it making an emergence again? I'm not sure about this because I, I think, I think they have, like, I think their idea is beyond great. Right. I was just like, I was stunned. No. I obviously, I you, didn't understand everything. You said a moment everything. ago that this is, um, but yeah, it's me... celestial. But can I ask you a question, Stella, about yeah. that? Sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. um, but I always thought that Celestia um it's a use case it's a modular blockchain that allows you to scale but the thing is is that that's going to compete against ethereum layer 2 scaling 
um, platforms, right? So I didn't. I I just felt well, that this was a add-on that is already stuff. being addressed exactly through other yeah. um, layer two uh, scaling solutions on the Ethereum ecosystem. And I just thought I wasn't sure if Celestia would have its uh, um, that sort of community behind it. I don't know. But if you think like we can, uh, I'd like to hear more from you about it. You know, it's it's very similar, I feel, to, uh, for example, Algorand, right? Algorand is a blockchain that has marvelous engineers doing incredible things, uh, but they have a lack in people who can explain it well. And yesterday, I think we had someone at the Ethereum Denver uh, Twitch stream, uh, Josh is his name, and he did a really good job at explaining it as simple as possible, which still, in my opinion, wasn't simple, right? But which could like give you like a raw grasp of how that, you know, how, like what the hell is a modular blockchain anyways, right? What does this even mean? So, and he has a, a good visual representation of, you know, what it actually means. So a little bit further, I, I wanted to try and call this up for you guys. A little bit further, he um, he explains this kind of very well. well in I just off my notes too. I, I, th I, I think I remember. I remember the graphic. I, can... I did. I did remember the graphic. Guarantee security. Look at this. And what were? Okay, I think hey. I remember yeah, this one. Thank you for asking. Ah shit! Yeah, this one. Can you see this? Are you guys still there? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is what modular means. I, I didn't know this. Maybe you guys did. I didn't know this. Right? It it essentially combines different uh different layers that happen within a blockchain into blocks mm -hmm. of layers, right? Depending on mm -hmm. what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to do a sovereign roll up you could com combine the execution and settlement layer into a sovereign rollup. And Celestia would put consensus and data availability into its own block. If you want to do a regular rollup, it would be a rollup, a settlement layer for execution and settlement. And Celestia would still take care of consensus and data availability. And he explains also data availability. And then there's the pure one that is Celestia. So meaning you could you could not only build your own blockchain and run it on what they call a light node. So it would be a blockchain you can run on like a minimum technical uh, effort, let's just say, right? It's also something that you can combine in a, in, a, in a modular way, the way you need it to be, right? For your specific need. So you don't have to rely on how other blockchains found consensus in doing something specific, right? You can build it out for the needs of what you're doing and for the needs of your participants or agents in the system, which mm. I thought could come in very handy when, for example, running an AMM, right? Mm. Because you could run an AMM to, to specific needs of a specific customer group because right now we always have to live with making a compromise right this is what andrew mentions a lot it's like yeah you always have to you know we can only optimize the system as much as we uh, find like the best possible compromise between different agents so when he talks for example slipper the discrepancy between slippage and impermanent loss right this is one thing where he says like okay you know there is like no perfect essentially right there is only compromise and while i think that is a very harmonious approach maybe we don't have to compromise if we build more niche products but then the question comes you know it's like it's a continuous dot chain i guess yeah, no, i mean the problem with the amm example here would be that uh, you'll end up uh, again like creating smaller liquidity pools and so so you're dividing liquidity um yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're making niche products, then you don't get a pool of like all the liquidity that you could have had in one place. Um, maybe I don't know if that affects. I think that again affects slippage. And I don't know, man. I, I feel like some of these 
like my hunch is that some of these problems are inherent to any system that we create like it's not going to be solved um i don't know like and it's very very important to at least um articulate what the core issue is with the dynamics of the and that's why like the initial thing that i said which is that um we see we find like i would i would want to build a company or like a dao or anything that that is um you know that works on the uh with assumptions of like good behavior and this and that and maybe growth isn't all that that that's important etc cetera, etc cetera. but the problem is you we are embedded in a system that's highly competitive that's winner take all and yeah. how do you uh, make sure that you can sustain your relatively nice because i mean it's almost like civilizations like you have a bunch of civilizations that you're um competing against and um it is a winner take all world unfortunately like if if china works all day on building firearms everybody's forced to do it like if some if if I'm, if if um, india works on like nuclear weapons then everybody kind of has to otherwise because if we get there and others don't get there now i can take the entire world over like and it's because there's always going to be one bad person out there and you're competing in a winner take all world so i feel like not always and not in all systems but to understand that is the system that we live in and therefore then we have to work around those constraints as to like we need to get this much revenue we need to pass it on like because because that's that's the thing with capitalism i feel like a lot of people say hey neoliberalism or capitalism this is the reason everything's going to shit i kind of agree but i also feel like it's not all capitalism it's a system dynamic problem which is way deeper like it's it's just the world is like that and you somehow have to create um like i don't know like the the over optimistic approaches sometimes break because they don't understand the fundamental structure which is this rivalrous non rivalrous things that are happening and i think lutra has a lot of points there where like yeah, yeah. Uh, really so yeah. my last sentence um of my presentation was blockchain technology is the invisible hand of the 21st century yeah. wow lovely <laughs> and, and i really see i yeah sounds at least it sounds nice right <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> no what i what i um want to say um capitalism as such isn't bad capitalism might be bad if you have rules in place that steer market operations and if those rules here yeah, um are not uh, correct let's call it like the wrong governance mechanisms yeah to have you know things we are going to uh, talk about with regard to our crypto space i guess a lot of the regulation with regard to financial markets was really bad regulation and that allowed the uh, some of the actors inside the system yeah to get very very rich on the cost of uh, a lot of people um but that's uh, not a problem of capitalism that's a problem you know of the market order yeah that we by ourselves yeah or let's call it the rulers yeah uh, have implemented the whole idea of the invisible hand of adam smith is about anti authoritarian steering mechanism yeah mm -hmm. and we do it by supply and demand and uh, that is anti authoritarian yeah exactly <laughs> i mean you can't really read it there's a famous there's a famous saying from uh, american economist john kenneth galbraith there are three books on earth that everybody is citing but no one have ever read it's a bible it's karl marx the capital and it's adam smith the wealth of nations <laughs> but at least you bought it <laughs> i i bought it and you want to know something lutra you're absolutely right because um uh i i have a few books and the books that i have are like this thick i have the other one is the rise and fall of the great nate paul kennedy that's a massive book i'm only like a quarter into that but these but these books are very dense but Yeah. Uh, it's on my it's on my shelf to read but i think you know the point you made very hard was, it's it's very it hard is. to read you to you know you to do the language because it's the language of the 18th century yeah, yeah. and yeah. um 
well, honestly, it's beside, you know, those nice metaphors, yeah? It's not that well written. We should have a reading set. We should have a, like, you know, po do you ever, are you, did you ever go to poetry jams? I went to poetry jams. There's a big thing in, 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 in Canada, poetry, you go there, you'd write a poetry, you go up on stage, you go up on stage and you'd say it and whatever, and they're just jamming. We should have a All of Nations reading jam and every... <laughs> At the, you know, I'm serious. At the at the beginning of every of every session, I just read a page. And anyways, but but the one thing I was just gonna say that I found interesting, you reminded me, is that you're right. Capitalism, the truest form of capitalism, is not all that bad. It's because it's about free markets, allowing the markets to operate in an like. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that capitalism, the consequences of capitalism, are are good or bad. I'm not saying that. But the theory behind it about free market theory, I think it's a very powerful narrative. And that I would almost ar not not argue, but I would almost insist that crypto <coughs> is a form of of capitalism and free market theory because now supply and demand freedom is not freedom of control. transaction it's like exactly. so it's not freedom of transaction right yes. if i yes. want to spend one billion on this nft please let me yeah let me. maybe exactly. it's worth less use less whatever but if yeah. i like to get it and if i'm willing and capable to pay the one million let me do it yeah and if we decide we use i don't know our otter coin yeah, and we can coordinate around this one. Yeah, let us use the otter coin. Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's almost a, oh, that's you that's were fun, showing us the otter coin, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. I'm buying it. I'm buying it. I am bought it. <laughs> oh, wait, Believe it or not. Yeah, but so uh, I'm I'm never on of. this road, yeah, yeah, into the crypto space, I want to develop my own coin, even if just the meme or something like that. Yeah, but. <laughs> Update, there has to be the other coin. Yeah, I am down for that. No, so that, that's so interesting. I, I actually never saw it that way, that it's a freedom to choose our currency itself. And it's a freedom to yeah. shell, have a shelling point around whatever we just, whatever the free market again decides the right currency should be. I never saw it that way. We have By trust rid in of it. Intermediaries. And if we can coordinate around it, right? Yeah. If you say, I am accepted this kind of currency, then it will be fine. Yeah. I guess what most people from the conventional financial sphere still didn't have yeah. is, um, you know, the knowledge, let's say about Bitcoin, yeah, because that's the OG. Mm. There are already more than 20, 30, 400 million people using and accepting it. So it's there, yeah. yeah. Wherever yeah. I go, from Ankara to Kuala Lumpur to Toronto, yeah? yeah. Nowadays, I am able to use my cryptocurrency. Yeah. Wow, yeah? yeah. Some years ago, impossible. Yeah. Now it's there because people are going to accept it. Yeah. And the more people uh, are going and uh, to accept it, yeah? the deeper we'll get the space. And then we get, you know, this kind of network effect. Yeah will lead to mass adoption and uh, somehow it might seem from appointment of a breath to take off i guess mm -hmm. yeah oh. i agree, oh. I agree. Um, just one quick question where are we with regard to the course i mean we had wonderful discussion <laughs> but since, since I missed last week, I mean, week, I tried I mean, to get us back on the course, but, was but on you guys five, were or, obsessed. Or just open discussion today. <laughs> I, I totally went in on chapter four, like all the time, but you guys were obsessed to go somewhere else. So I was like, yeah, let's, I think give, it, I let's give it a, let's give it a flow. That was good. I just want to check okay, back with that last week. <laughs> okay, wait. I can I can show you my current state, and maybe yeah. we can use that as a reference. So I'm at yeah. the end of this chapter, which is the end of seven. So I have still eight, nine, and ten in front of me, and then I'm hmm. done. Is it like are you guys on a similar level about this with reading or testing? Because I have to yes. go through the chapters, but then I still have to do 
uh, my Google Collab, verifying the digital twins simulation experiments and procedures. I haven't like actually done done this. And mm. the performance indicators was like what threw me off a little bit. This is why I brought this up because I was like, yeah, I, like, it's not like I don't understand this, right? This makes me happy yeah. too, right? Whenever I trade. Um, but it was like, hey, probably there should be more organic. I want to call them organic metrics that we could factor in. So we built even AMMs and systems that let people st stick around, even though the market doesn't look as bright. You know, because you know, Stella, I was just wondering, um, maybe if like uh, it, it's highly reliant on Rohan, to be honest, <laughs> but I was just thinking, um, what if we like we kind of um, flip the script, uh, as they say in, in, in television or in the movie industry? And maybe why don't we take each like some of them where you are in the module? Right. And why don't we just take that and go through that? in the class and try to work through whatever exercise in the visual learners. It'll take us a little bit longer, but um, unless anybody else has any objections, I, I'm, I'm okay to, to meet and do that. I think there's a lot of value in just going through that, but it might require a little bit more um, uh, Rohan expertise you know, <laughs> to uh, fix on, our on syntax yeah. errors. So I mean, I can, we I need, can do we that. Need to... I, can, I can, you know, make a run through, I want to say, didn't I already verify the digital twin in my co Google Collab? I think I already did this, no? I just didn't do the individual versus tandem test, I think. This is what I haven't done yet. Um, mm. But I could do that and and try to do the other ones, right? And then, oh, damn, guys, actually, shit, no, I can't. Next week, Friday, I'm on a plane during our call. Ah, oh, OK. I'm going to East That's Denver, okay. so I won't, be, I won't be here, actually. Shouldn't oh, no. we change so, the date for no, our wait. Uh, meetup? This is a great opportunity because I'm usually the one being the most vulnerable in the group and showing off all the skills that I don't have. So how about you guys figure out who of you does it this time? Do yeah, let's go. I think right? that's cool. Yeah, we get because we get. Right I don't know, like knows, right? Lucha to like we get Lucha to uh, share the screen. Yeah. All right, all right. So, uh, which chapters should I prepare for next Friday then? Uh, oh. hmm. Five, six, seven? Six, seven. All right. No need to prepare. Uh, we could actually just run through it together, maybe, and uh, try to see how easy or hard it is to run the code. Um, maybe but if you want to spend some time, I think, to get used to it, great. But yeah. But he has to share the screen. Remember, you're not allowed to share the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On a screen, yeah. Yeah, I will be strict oh. about this. If I see something different in the recording, you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to also figure out uh, recording, but I'll do that, I think. I'll figure out how, how my OBS works. Well, I'm getting excited. <laughs> Love oh, look at that. That's good. That's good. That's great. You know what I was wondering, guys? Yeah. Um, so I was actually thinking for the uh, to help the broader community, um, what we can continue, like with the chapter four, like we can continue doing this over the time, but, um, you know, like actually, uh, take it further. Like currently we've just built the mechanisms. We've not involved behaviors yet because that's where the real power of this cat cat approach comes in. Right. So I'm saying that maybe we can build a system where we can reason through it together as to like, if there's a person who is coming with bad intentions, what would they do? Like, would they like, uh, you know, try to take advantage, maybe an arbit arbitrage or like maybe create two pools and create an arbitrage or something other. Because I can do it technically, but I think maybe I can show you all what I'm doing and then we can actually come up with those what if scenarios and actually build something that we can discuss and then share that Google collab with other people, like as to or oh, there are arbitrages in the system, or there are people who are, like first will be stress testing, just like see that these are the actions a person can take. Let's make them take all the actions in random order and see whether our system breaks or not. Like what happens to impermanent loss, so, what happens to snippage. So you want to yeah. build a bad agent sheet sheet? <laughs> yeah, 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 basically. And, and see um, if we can, if we add fees to it, what happens? I, I mean, I'm trying to just think through 
if I'm making an EMM and I know nothing about like the bad actors, the good actors, whatever, right? I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and I just have this idea right now. What can I do with the resources that we have with Cat Cat and Machinations to actually get something in? Because I feel like so far it's still vague in my head. Like personally, like even with the work I'm doing at places, it feels like even to them it's pretty vague. Like we are very severely restricting what we are looking at, and then saying that okay, we got some conclusions from it just to yeah. make everybody happy. But we're not actually like deeply uh, studying the systems that we should. And maybe the AMM example is a simple one where I can actually dig deeper if we, if I get your voices into like, hey, let's check this, let's check that, like maybe something like that. I you don't know. You know what? What I think also one of the one of the issues with that is that an AMM is being treated as like its own entity, right? I think an AMM, honestly, like in the larger context, only makes sense in a larger context. So if an AMM is so I mean, sounds really stupid comparing those two things because they are obviously nothing alike, right? But, yeah. you know, imagine there would be a bank without a society or a society without a bank, right? Yeah. It would be completely drawn out of context. But this is what we're trying to do here, right? We're essentially saying we are isolating this for the purpose of study, right? And so the AMM is like in this little vacuum box in a sense. So yeah. I think it would serve us best so i agree with you on one hand on the other hand i'm like hey why don't we first like go through chapter five right because yeah. that gives us the society component is what i'm trying to say and yeah. then rethink this right because mm -hmm. then we can actually put one and two to together essentially and look at what is the society we you know for study purpose we want to build we refer to right what is like the values, the, the consensus within that group? And then mm. essentially go back to the AMM and be like, what kind of AMM, AMM would serve that society best? Mm. Does that make sense what yeah. I just said to, to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that does. Um, like understanding the behavior. Uh, um, hmm. Also, it refers I'm... to design thinking, hmm. right? You, you don't just produce something. Engineers do this a lot, I feel. And this is also when design got introduced to engineering. So essentially mm. design emerged from engineering at some point, right? Mm. Because engineers build for the sake of building, right? While designers are purpose driven. So we build for the necessity of building something or building a solution for something. It's a very different yeah. approach in a sense. So if you combine those two th strengths into one, you build with purpose, right? You engineer with purpose. So purpose can only be given by the society you want to introduce a product to. Hence mm. the, you know, going forth, then going back approach. No, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, I, either way we should, I was thinking like, um, spending like maybe 10 minutes per session just having a discussion on this so that we can keep building towards it. Okay. Because uh, I'll be honest, right? Like, uh, I, I'm very, I'm still very unclear as to where CAD-CAD and machinations actually fits in, in verification and testing of these systems. Like, mm -hmm. I understand in on the broad front that like, we should be doing all this, but what should we be doing? I still don't know. Like, what should I be testing? Like, should I be testing... Um, Got you. Like, I mean, and what will make sure that my uh, that I've thought through most of the scenarios? Like, I, I, I don't think I'm clear as to how I can use these tools effectively. Um, you, you are searching for the, the attack vectors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how can I search for it? Will it always require me to strategically think myself and build a agent like that to do that? Or can I think of a, a way in which I can build a agent that does random things and then through that behavior find here what the hell like I didn't expect this to happen like because that would be actually be useful where I can use that for multi I don't know I you know what I'm saying like I'm still confused uh, I, as I, to, I, yeah. I think I hear you I think that is where like um I think Andrew introduced and in, I want to say in I want to say it's in this chapter he introduces the Monte Carlo algorithm right to introduce randomness mm. and that that uh, you know 
I was like, yeah, okay, randomness, I get that, right? And maybe by chance you come uh, across um, a specific problem that then causes the AMM to fail, I, I understand. But with AI becoming like a very present thing in our everyday lives, right? Like us coming up with like, you know, randomly generated issues that the AMM might face will be just too slow as in, you know, mm-hmm. taking your approach to it as well. So you're saying, right, you have problems generating like all of these different scenarios, right? Mm. And then we have on the other side, we have people who have access to AI technology now who might just become those bad agents, right? So okay. th- that is like if, in if no that's proportion. Case, then let's use AI to figure things out. Cause that's what I want to try like... and say. Yeah, let's use AI oh, okay. to figure this out because then we are at least at least playing on the same uh, battlefield, right? Yeah, because yeah. If, if we are trying to melt our brains to come up with different scenarios, we are like down here, right? Yeah. And on the other side, AI, uh, AI. Uh, quantum computing with itself, let's just say, right? <laughs> We're like completely outmatched, we like drop off the grid. And I think this will be the next big problem, right? The next big problem will be how do we ensure safety if there are mechanisms out there or technologies out there that can think of so many more scenarios yeah. than ourselves if we don't implement um, them in our no. way of you know working? So the question is, how can we get AI to be built into you know, finding more metrics? I think that's one mm. goal, right? Metrics and indicators, one goal. And the other goal is... Um, identifying more risk scenarios to an AMM, yeah. for example. Mm. It's those two goals that we could potentially match by utilizing AI. Yeah. 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 I'm just not sure about my next steps, because if, let's say, AMM was the product I'm building, and or I'm advising a team that's building this, um, as a token engineer, I actually don't know what I'm doing. Like uh, beyond, like I know machinations, I know CATCA, I can recreate the model that you have from causal loops and stock inflow. But then what do I do with the model? Because if I'm not getting any real insights that are actually actionable for the team or maybe getting some parameters that they need, hey, you need these many liquidity providers to traders. And then then you have a good something. Like I, I still don't know what we're looking for. Like what, what are we looking for? Yeah. How much liquidity um, do you need, yeah, yeah in sure. order to reduce slippage and so on and so forth? Is there some kind of critical mass or tipping point of the system? But yeah. uh, you're not sure about how, you know, to search for this kind of tipping point or something like that. And even that. the questions itself, if we can come up with the questions, I have the tech expertise to actually find the answers. So maybe if we can sit together and think of the questions, okay, hey, like, okay, this was the model we built, like of the AMM now, uh, what are the questions that are really relevant for someone as an entrepreneur that would need to know, okay, hey, the, my uh, fee value should be this to fix this, this, this. Because uh, fee is the only parameter we have control over in the entire system. Um, and apparently- Wait, Question. But, hmm, yeah. Do you want to ask like, okay, who are you building so there is a very different question set of questions going on you just say like what are the questions that an entrepreneur wants to have answered right but the entrepreneur actually wants to build the system for a group of customers right Hmm. so you need to make sure that his questions do align with what his customers want because if that's not in alignment you already face the problem of building a product that might not get adopted Mm-hmm. So it's like, you yeah. know, um, like this needs to be mm-hmm. in alignment. If that is already not in alignment, then it's no matter what kind already of questions design. you yeah. ask. Yeah. So maybe yeah. you could ident- can you identify this for us? Like uh, as- identify the, uh, who, who the um, so, stakeholders are like that? Yeah, essentially start, start from the, the, I guess the discovery phase, right? Yeah. They say like, okay, so this is this is where the stakeholders come from. This is like the core of customers we are building this for, right? Yeah. And then there is, you know, the entrepreneur who is probably his his her own goals in all of this, right? Yeah. So the team of the entrepreneur how wants much, their own, yeah. How much yeah. of this is in alignment and how much of this is in disalignment? I think that's the first mm-hmm. step. And from there, mm. we can start asking questions on 
you know, what are possible risk scenarios that yeah. I, can also be caused by a disalignment of the former, I feel. Yeah. It could be caused by mm. that. Yeah. No, but like in the AMM scenario, honestly, maybe my phrasing was wrong. Uh, okay. The reason so I said entrepreneur was because uh, there will always be an entrepreneur and team which will in initially build it and they are the ones who are going to hire us if we are ever token engineers. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, that's why I thought about, because that's what happened to my, me in the marketplace that I was helping design, right? Um, where like, they have questions as to, oh, what is the vesting schedule? And, and I realized that that's basically the main uh, question that comes like, hey, what are the actual, what is the vesting schedule? What is the, to how much tokens do we need? When, sh when should we launch it? Who should we sell it to? Uh, the tokenomics questions were the ones that they really cared about. The token engineering stuff, they were more like, that seems like, I mean, that's almost like due diligence. Like, I mean, if you want to do it, do it. Like they, they were kind of like, yeah. very dismissive of it. But we were more like, hey, like, no, this is what you should focus on. Because yeah. uh, when what you do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they want to hear something like best practice from you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Like, all right, with regard to ACE, they did it over such a period of time and it was more like an airdrop and so on that was successful mm -hmm. and they want the best solution for their business case, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they want that and um, I don't think most people have any understanding as to what brings sustainability because for them it's like, oh, we'll just do a vampire attack on this protocol and we'll get all of the customers by airdropping things to them and they'll be on our thing and great. But it's like, Oh, it's only great until you're giving them free shit. And then once you're not, they, they, they are out again because there's no stickiness. You're, you've not actually built anything for them to stay. And yeah, but uh, question is, okay, what is, uh, one question is, okay, what should the product have for the people to stay? But that's almost like a product question. But I think on the tokenomics level, let's assume the product gets to a stage which is actually useful for people. Like there is a, we can assume some kind of product demand, like there's a and demand that's